Hi and welcome to the RoboHub podcast. Today we're going to dive into the world of autonomous flight with a company called X-Wing, based in San Francisco, California. At X-Wing, they're converting traditional aircraft into remotely operated ones. They do this by retrofitting planes with multiple sensors, including cameras, radar and LiDAR, and by developing sensor fusion algorithms to allow their planes to understand the world around them using highly accurate perception algorithms. X-Wing's autonomous flight technology allows a plane to taxi in the airport, take off, fly to a destination, avoid airborne and ground threats, and to land all without any human input. So this technology not only enables autonomous flight, but it may also enhance the safety of manned aircraft by improving a plane's ability to understand its surroundings. Our interview at Bate catches up with X-Wing CTO, Maxime Gariel, to learn more. Hey, welcome to the RoboHub podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, so I'm uh, Maxime Gariel. I'm the CTO at X-Wing. And my background has been always in uh, aerospace engineering. I started my career developing autopilots for airliners and especially Autoland. And that's when I discovered that what I really love, I knew I loved airplane, but making them fly themselves, like that was a revelation. Um, after that, I got uh, my master's and PhD in aerospace engineering, uh, looking at air traffic management. And what happens when you add more technology into this already very complex system, Uh, You know, where you have all the sectors, so you have a lot of humans directing airplanes, you have pilots and you have airports. Uh, So what happens when you put more and more technology into that system, uh, like ADSB or um, or self-separation when you allow pilots to uh, separate? And what happens when you have a problem? What happens when you have failures? So always looking at what is your plan B, your plan C, um, and ensuring that the system can degrade gracefully. Um, then I did a short postdoc at MIT to look at uh, conflict avoidance between aircraft and then spent uh, a number of years at Rockwell Collins to uh, convert existing helicopters into fully automated helicopters, uh, taking you know 1980s helicopters and add, adding redundant flight control system. So going from fully manned to fully unmanned and having a really high level of, uh, of reliability and, uh, and redundancy. And I joined X-Wing when we opened the office about five years ago. Uh, very interesting. So for quite a large portion of your career, you've actually been working on building autonomous aircraft. How advanced is this industry? How, how long has this been around? What is very interesting is the, you know, the first autopilot uh, was built in 1912. Uh, so autopilot uh, automation in the aviation industry is, is not something new. Uh, so we are, uh, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, lots of work has been done over um, decades, and now we're reaching a point where uh, we're having all of the pieces of technology mature enough so that we can reliably control uh, those aircraft uh, remotely or like monitor them re- remotely. Um, it's really about uh, the confluence of um, all the technology and safety that has been done over the past 100 years, plus uh, some new technology that comes uh, in particular from the self-driving car industry, like on the perception side. We're leveraging a lot of, uh, of that technology. Mm-hmm. And can you tell us a little bit about what your team at X-Wing is building um, and what, what, what's the product that they're creating? Yeah, so the the mission at X-Wing is to dramatically change how um, humans move uh, for distances that are typically too long to drive, but too short to fly commercial. So think about uh, regional mobility, 100 to 500 miles. Uh, So what we are doing is uh, putting together all of the technology so that uh, human goods can move autonomously uh, throughout the airspace uh, using what uh, will eventually be clean vehicles. But uh, first of all, we're focusing on the uh, autonomy part. So the first product that we are uh, looking at is to retrofit existing aircraft. So uh, the target is the Cessna Caravan. It's an aircraft that can carry um, 10 to 14 passengers, depending on where you are in the world, uh, for distances up to 1,000 miles. So it's it's, a pretty sizable aircraft. 
and we are adding our technology so that we can fly it, um, we can operate it from the ground without a pilot being on board. Um, so very exciting, um, exciting uh, work, lots of challenges, uh, both on the technology side as well as on the regulatory side, right? It has never been done before, so it's pushing the, the boundaries and working with the regulators, in this case, the FAA, to get approval to do so. Mm -hmm. So this company is building autonomous aircraft to be able to ship goods and maybe not people, but just the goods from one place to another without anybody on board of the airplane. Th that's correct. Um, we're taking a very pragmatic approach. Our goal is to change human mobility, but we're doing that one step at a time. So we're starting with cargo uh, because it's easier, you it's easier to... Uh, to do, you don't have to deal with people. You don't have to. Uh, you don't put risk, people at risk initially. Uh, the public acceptance is going to be easier. And um, you know, the the US have over five thousand small airports that we can leverage, um, and very few of those are actually used uh, for commercial flights. So our goal is to uh, leverage this infrastructure to bring uh, initially cargo to. Um, all the people around the US and to really, really uh, bring communities together. Uh, you have a lot of small communities that don't have access to uh, fresh uh, food, to uh, you know, legal documents overnight. So it's really about shortening distances and uh, bringing uh, what we you know, in a city experience every day to all the people around the, the US and around the world. Mm -hmm. And this might sound like a bit of an obvious question, but what are some of the benefits of taking the human pilot out of the loop for these autonomous flights? What are some of the extra features that can be added and some of the advantages? So one of the main uh, benefit is to make the asset more available. So right now we have enough aircraft, but it's really difficult for the operators to get pilots uh, to be able to fly the routes that they need. Because when there might be demand somewhere, we may be able to get an aircraft but it's really difficult sometimes to get a pilot to live in those locations and to fly maybe a couple of hours a day. Um, so it's about going from having to find the demand and the pilot and the aircraft to only having to deal with the aircraft and the demand. You can rebalance your network much more easily. You can uh, shift off all of your assets overnight where it's needed. Um, so it's, it makes, um, it opens up a lot of, uh, of new markets. And at the same time, uh, you know, we want to, our first market is to target the uh, logistics company like FedEx and UPS. And they fly every day um, what they have, what we call like feeder airlines. So feeder um, uh, flights where uh, the large aircraft comes in in the morning very early in a major hub then they offload all the packages either to small airplanes or to trucks. And the small airplanes are going to fly another 100 miles, for instance. And then they offload to the packet, to the uh, truck so that the packages can be at people's house by 10 a.m. or the business in, the, in some cases. So um, it's helping the large logistics company uh, deliver on their promise of next day delivery. Uh, and help some of the primes of uh, hiring pilots. Uh, there is a significant shortage of pilots. Uh, COVID actually made that even worse uh, because lots of pilots went into early retirement at the beginning of COVID. And now that the demand uh, is picking up, it's really hard to, uh, to hire pilots again. Yeah. And if you were to break down the problem space of autonomous flight into three categories, so perception of the environment, planning for the route and control of the vehicle. How would you describe the challenges that each of these um, has at, on a high level? Yeah, so the, the problem with, with tackling is really the, uh, the typical robotics problem as you, you broke it down, like perceptions, control, uh, planning and control. Uh, the, the perception is uh, one of the new pieces and the most changing pieces that we, ha we have to deal with. Um, in our case, the perception starts on the airport surface where we have to be able to taxi. And that has never been done before, actually. So uh, we need to be able to see 
around us, all their aircraft, uh, you know, some of the markings, um, all their vehicles that may be um, driving around people, animals. Uh, so this is very, com very common with the self-driving car problem. So we have to solve the self-driving car problem, but into a, a more controlled environment. Um, you know, the airport, um, we have fewer things that can happen. And for us, if we have an obstacle, we stop. So it's the self-driving car problem, but uh, easier. Then when we start flying, uh, we have what is called a detect and avoid uh, problem to solve, which is the ability of the aircraft to detect other airplanes that fly or airplanes or helicopters or whatever it may be, and then safely reroute around them. Uh, this is uh, a very challenging problem because we have to look really far. We have to be able to see other airplanes up to uh, five miles away, right? So um, the sensors for self-driving cars are no, not well suited. Um, and, we all, and the reason we have to see that far is because we fly quite fast. We fly ourselves at 170 knots. Uh, there may be another airplane flying at 170 knots. So that's uh, 340 knots, which is, you know, around like, I don't know, 370 miles per hour of closing speed. So that's why you have to see really far to have enough time to safely avoid and maintain a safe distance. The, the separation distance between aircraft is around, we want at least 2000 feet, right? So you need to be able to have enough time to see the other person, make your decision, change your trajectory, and maintain 2,000 feet of separation. How does that compare to, say, a human pilot who's driving a plane and then they're seeing the other planes out there? Um, do, are they also just visually, manually detecting these other planes out there and then maybe looking at sensors like radar or something um, to detect what the path is going to be? Yes. Um, when pilots are in contact with air traffic control, air traffic control is going to uh, let them know of other traffic, and in some cases, ask the pilot to change their trajectory to avoid other aircraft. But not every aircraft is talking to air traffic control, and that's way it becomes uh, challenging. Um, we have to be able to detect airplanes that do not take to air traffic control and may not be equipped even with a what is called a transponder. Most aircraft have a transponder that broadcasts uh, their identity, and in some cases, uh, what is called ADSB, where they also broadcast their position and their speed and their velocity. Uh, but not all of the aircraft have that. So we need to get to the lowest common denominator, which is be able to detect uh, cell planes, um, you know, the very old uh, World War II airplanes that don't have a radio or a transponder. So we need to be able to see all of this, uh, this aircraft. So when you have a pilot, the pilot typically has to look out and find those airplanes. So it's it's very challenging, it's very difficult. And uh, in many cases, um, pilot miss those other airplanes. So our system can do better than actually a pilot. Hmm. That's actually a little bit terrifying to hear, but so there there's planes out there flying and is this a, is this a large number of planes? Or is it all those small little planes? It's, it's small little planes, all of the big, all of the, uh, large airliners that we commonly fly to go from point A to point B um, fly into different classes of airspace. They fly into airspaces where everybody needs to have a transponder and everybody has to talk to a traffic control. Um, when we are talking about the market we are we, we, we're playing in, right, the uh, small feeder, we don't fly as high. We fly between five and 10,000 feet. We fly where like all the general aviation uh, people fly. So that's where you have a lot more traffic. The airliners uh, start from major airports. They climb all the way to 18,000 feet and above where everybody is talking to a traffic control. We are flying in a different class of airspace. And it sounds like the communication between these planes, it's plane, air traffic control, and then other plane, and they're both communicating through this middleman. There's no direct plane to plane type of communication that happens. The pilot will talk to a traffic control that will talk to other airplanes, but you share the frequency so you can hear what's, you know, who is talking to who, but you don't always have the full um, view of where the other people are. 
then the airplane themselves may be equipped with a transponder that will broadcast their position so that other airplanes uh, can, can grab this information and display to, to the pilot. So in some cases, we know very far where the other airplanes are and where they're going. And in some cases, we have no idea and we have to detect them really close and do like an avoidance maneuver. And that's the challenging portion of the detect and avoid. Okay, yeah, very interesting. And you, you covered it a little bit earlier, but what are some of the um, benefits to having X-Wing's autonomous perception and flight planning on board versus a traditional aircraft? The aircraft is able to um, go from point from one airport to the other airport without um, the need of a, of, a, of a human, right? So from uh, a benefit standpoint, it's removing the need for a pilot co-located with the aircraft. It's also going to improve safety as uh, our system monitors the health of the aircraft throughout the flight and across flight so that we can do uh, preventive maintenance. But mostly uh, the aircraft is equipped with um, you know, almost 360 view. So we, when we taxi, we can see everything that, that's happening. Uh, when we are flying with a detect and avoid system, we can maintain a safe separation distance. Um, and we can also optimize the trajectory of the aircraft to minimize fuel burns in our case. Um, so also, I wanted to, to go back to the previous question. We talked about uh, you know, the, the, the perception side, where it's a, it's a problem. Then on the uh, planning side, the aircraft has to know, um, has, needs to have the full, full vision of uh, who is around, what they're doing, so that we can reroute in real time. Uh, and, and that's new. Uh, currently, aircraft require the pilot to uh, input modification to the flight plan. In our case, we are able to dynamically reroute uh, either in case of contingency. So if we lose the engine, the aircraft can determine that, um, can feel like what is the closest airport? How do I get there? Uh, do I have enough energy to, to reach that airport? Um, as well as if I see other uh, airplanes, the, the aircraft can navigate around them. And finally, the controls problem uh, so the controls prime is the part that has been uh, worked on for uh, for decades. So there is no need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, autopilots, uh, flight control computers, servos, those are things that um, avionics companies have been doing for, for many years that we can leverage. Some of the new part, though, um, no aircraft can take off on its own. So that's, that's a new part of the problem to be solved. Uh, aircraft cannot taxi, so we have to solve the taxiing prime, which is actually quite challenging. Aircraft are made to fly, and they can also drive, but they're not the best at driving. <laughs> and, um, and, and finally, landing is also um, one of the challenges. In that case, it's a challenge of controls, but also uh, navigation. We want to make sure that we can land on the runway every time, regardless of um, uh, the sensor that, that we're using. Um, large aircraft can land automatically on at about like 55 airports in the US. And we want to target 5,000 without adding a lot of new technology. So how do we solve this navigation and localization problem very accurately um, it is one of the, the challenges to solve. Mm -hmm. And so just to capture an idea of the scale of uh, this challenge. So right now, taxiing in an airport, that is a uh, situation that has a lot of room for accidents, for large catastrophes. You know, we've seen some high profile planes just taxiing and the, another plane lands into it. And then both, uh, both planes have very massive casualties. So how difficult is this problem to solve? And um, what are you guys doing to solve the taxiing problem? So, yeah, th there has been a lot of um, accidents where like airplanes would clip the wings of other airplanes, right? They don't realize how wide they are or they, they clip, you know, uh, a light post or something like that. With the sensor we have on board, we know exactly where obstacles are with respect to us. So we can uh, and we will stop before there is any, uh, any incident. 
uh, we have a really good situation awareness of uh, the aircraft and its surroundings so that um, the taxiing will be much, much safer. Is, is there any reason why um, these sensors and this software algorithm wouldn't also be installed on manned flights with a pilot just to decrease that error rate on their end? It's, um, it, it will be. Um, right now, already over the past, uh, I don't know, 10 years, uh, cameras have been installed on uh, large airplanes to help the pilot uh, see the, the wingtips and uh, you know, track the over and center line. There is no reason to not add uh, eventually those new sensors. I think uh, you know it takes a bit of time for this new technology to get into the aviation um, realm because it's uh, it needs to be certified. Uh, but once we certify it, then you know it will uh, it can be used for much larger aircraft. A lot of the technology that we are developing can help uh, human pilots actually. Uh, if you think about the detect and avoid. Even though we want to close the loop entirely, so we want the aircraft to get the detect and avoid uh, data and to replan automatically, just providing that uh, situation awareness, that information about other traffic, where they are with respect to us, what they're doing, tremendously helps um, current pilots and could increase the safety and reduce the, uh, the number of accidents. In, in small aviation, there, there are a lot of uh, uh, um, accidents where one pilot, the two aircraft on final landing at the same runway, and one lands on top of the other one just because they cannot see through the nose of the aircraft. So they cannot see the other person. Without detecting a void system, that situation would never happen. Um, for helicopter pilots also, it's, uh, it's, it's challenging because helicopter pilots can, can change um, you know, heading and direction very quickly. So having all of this information provided to, to them would be extremely valuable. So you've mentioned having cameras installed at various parts of the airplane and how that can create a situation where you don't have these blind spots anymore. What are some of the other sensors and um, some of the sensor fusion that's happening on this plane to make this a magical product? On the ground uh, for taxiing, we're using a combination of uh, cameras and LIDARs as well as uh, as GPS, of course. Um, and using cameras and LiDAR help us, so in one way to train the cameras to, uh, you know, to learn uh, what's around. So eventually we could get rid of the LiDAR, but in the short term, the LiDAR is really good to, uh, to get this depth, uh, to know how far uh, other airplanes are and how far obstacles are. Um, and once we start flying, we use a combination of radar, um, ADSB. So ADSB is um, an aviation specific uh, system where we use the existing transponder as well as GPS and each aircraft broadcasts their position and their velocity and the other aircraft can receive that. So you can see from really far away, like 50 miles where other airplanes are. So that, that's very helpful, but not everybody has it. And that's part of the, the problem. So for those aircraft, we use the transponder, we use ADSB. For the aircraft that are not equipped, we use the radar and the cameras. Uh, and we fuse all of this to get the best track possible for all the other airplanes. And then we make decisions based on, on those tracks. So the long-term vision is to take your LiDAR and then use this as a ground truth to train your um, video from your cameras to detect the distance to objects and create. Is this going to be a 3D point cloud um, of the environment around it? So on the ground, we need to, um, the goal is to re remove the LiDAR, right? If we have more sensors that are expensive, <laughs> we'd be happy to remove them. Uh, we don't need to in the, in the short term, uh, but, but you're right. The, the, the goal is to detect all of the objects around us and figure out, are they in the way, uh, are there danger uh, to us? Uh, can we keep on, on you know, taxing safely? Or do we need to reroute? Uh, when we are airborne, uh, the prime is much more uh, challenging uh, because as I was describing, the distance we're looking at, uh, trying to detect a small airplane five miles away with a camera is extremely challenging. And also, uh, you know, the cameras don't work really well at night. Uh, we seem to be able to, uh, don't work really well like in the rain. Um, so we need to be able to detect those other vehicles uh, in all weather conditions. So that's where um, 
radar, for instance, works really well. Like RF is not impacted too much by uh, by weather and by you know time of day. And so another thing about this uh, environment that you're working in, especially when you're flying in the air, you don't have a lot of features around you. And that's what makes it very different from, say, a self-driving car or from taxiing. You can judge the distance to objects a little bit from a structured, featured environment. Once you're in the air and a plane is five miles away and you know it's coming towards you, I can imagine that would be very difficult to gauge what that distance is, and there would be a large error bar over there. Yes, you're completely right. Um, if you take, you know, a Cessna 172 and a Cessna Caravan from far away, they look very similar, but one is um, twice as big as the other one. So if you just look at, um, you know, this image against the blue sky, um, is it the one, is Cessna 172 that is like two miles away? Or is it the Cessna Caravan that is four miles away? Because those two things are going to look to have the same number of pixels, to have almost the same shape. Um, so you, you're completely right. Uh, using only cameras to detect at long distances, uh, we have this range uncertainty problem. Um, so cameras are not very well suited. What they can be used for is to um, validate some of the other sensors. Um, one of the problems of ADSB, uh, so ADSB, as I was describing earlier, is this communication protocol where everybody broadcasts their position, but it has a problem of uh, security. It's not a secure protocol. Anybody can, um, you know, create a software-defined radio and start broadcasting. It, it's illegal, but people can start doing this type of things. And if uh, suddenly you know, a bad actor wants to generate a lot of uh, fake airplanes around me, I need a way to validate that those um, uh, those fake airplanes, if th that's those uh, targets I receive, are they fake or are they real? So one way is to use the camera and to say, do I see an object, you know, where uh, I got this ADSB ping? So the cameras can be used to validate radar, to validate ADSB. Uh, and to improve also the uh, the overall solution. Um, the radar is really good at uh, range, for instance, but it's not very good in azimuth elevation. The camera on the other hand, other hand is going to be very good at um, azimuth elevation because that's the pixels, but 3D point range. So if you put the two together, then you have a really good position and velocity for the other aircraft. Yeah, no, that's actually a very a bit of a scary point you bring up that you can just broadcast these plain fake planes over ADSB um, or fake plane signals. Um, is this something that's actually been done before, um, or is this a, just a theoretical vulnerability? It's a um, some researchers have done it, right? Um, the consequences of doing it are, are significant, right? Because you're messing up with the federal uh, government. Uh, so I, I don't think anybody is going to go and, you know, start doing this from, um, from the, from their bedroom. It's going to, it's somebody who is, um, you know, ill intention, uh, could do it. Um, so it can happen. Um, it, it has, research has shown that it can be done, uh, but I haven't seen, I haven't seen it done like with a bad intention yet. Yeah. But regardless of whether or not this is bad intention or maybe you're getting faulty sensor readings from some of the sensors or some sort of weird reflection, whatever, the sensor fusion, al al sensor fusion algorithm is able to compensate for that and use each sensor to double check the outputs from the other. And then that's how you create this redundancy um, when you're flying. When you go fly, you don't think twice about the safety. Right, you assume that, and you know that you're gonna get there. So aviation has this really high uh, requirement for safety. Uh, airliners, uh, the the target level of safety is one catastrophic failure, so one failure that can lead to a loss of life per billion flight hours. Right, so when you Airbus or Boeing designs the aircraft, they have to demonstrate. Um, theoretically, that the aircraft will have a level of safety and reliability of one catastrophic failure per billion flight hours. 
In our case, we have smaller airplanes, so the level of safety is smaller, but we're talking about one per 100 million flight hours, which is still very, very significant. So the way to achieve it is to have redundancy and to have various ways of doing the same thing. So that's why you have different sensors that when they all work, you get the best solution possible. And when one starts failing, you still have a backup. So it's aviation is all about having a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, and a plan D. Mm -hmm. I can imagine. Um, so you touched earlier about um, you know training your uh, data from your cameras based on your LIDAR output. So you get some machine learning and you can do some nice distance estimates and trajectory, I'm assuming estimates of other planes and objects flying by. Is there any other interesting uh, machine learning algorithms that are being uh, done under the hood in this plane? We have to certify the aircraft and the FAA and the community. Um, so we need to use deterministic uh, methods as much as possible. Um, so we are not relying on, um, you know, AI and machine learning for um, safety critical uh, items, and we don't need to. That, that's a nice thing. We don't need to. We could, but it's not required. Um, and the reason is we need to demonstrate with a really high level of safety. I was describing uh, a few minutes ago uh, that the system will perform as intended with the probability of failure like extremely, extremely mm -hmm. small. And right now we have no way of showing that AI uh, can do that. Though the other place where, uh, for instance, AI and machine learning can be used is, uh, for instance, for localization. If you think about um, landing, um, you know, detecting a runway is something where um, machine learning and AI is perfect, right? Perfect application. Instead of looking for a cat or for a dog, you look for a runway. And if that's the runway, what is my position with, with, with respect to it? So in that case, uh, those techniques can be used to complement the existing sensors, to, uh, to validate uh, the GPS position that we have, or to augment, in some cases, the, the GPS position that we have. So it's not the primary method, but it's, it's an augmentation or, or a backup. Mm -hmm. And so is this kind of a similar attitude that the certification um, has for self-driving cars as it is for um, the aviation space? Or is it a little bit more extreme because aviation is just like security is number one? Um, it's much more extreme. Um, like on the self-driving cars, right? Uh, Tesla is pushing updates on a, I don't know if it's a daily basis or, but very regularly and nobody looks at it, right? People try it and are guinea pigs. Um, in the aviation space, before we put our technology in the hands of, um, before we can use it to make money and generate revenue, it has to be certified. The FAA has to go through every single line of code, every requirement. Uh, we have to demonstrate the level of safety before we can, uh, you know, put in uh, on the market. Um, so it's it's much more more challenging than on the uh, self driving car space. And, um... So that, that's all very interesting. And just to backtrack a little bit about the market and who the customers are for this, um, how would you categorize the, the market into different groups? So the, the you know, while the long-term vision is to move people and to move the, the world, uh, the short-term goal and where we're very focused on is to be able to introduce this technology for uh, cargo and for the logistics company. So FedEx, UPS, DHL, Amazon, um, and then you have a lot of other people that uh, have urgent cargo needs. So it has to be, you know, payloads that have a certain value because it's the value of time that you're saving. Um, but initially we're looking at, uh, yes, the, the feeder market for the large logistics company. So uh, for instance, FedEx uh, owns its own fleet of uh, Cessna caravans. They have about 260 of them and they lease them to uh, small operators, a number of small operators that fly them for, for, for FedEx. UPS, on the other hand, has um, delegates to operators that own their aircraft, um, and they, they're geographically you know, in different parts of the, of the US. And then um, all of those operators, a very fragmented market, um, 
provide this service to uh, to UPS and FedEx in that case. Uh, so that's where we um, that's the market we we're entering. And as as that uh, as we solve this problem of uh, safe integration of aircraft in the U in in the airspace, uh, we'll be able to put passenger on board and expand around the world. Uh, but the market is very significant already in the in the US. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the next steps at X Wing? So the next step is to um, several of them. Uh, one of them is to continue the certification of our technology. Uh, so this is a process that uh, that takes time, that is very rigorous. Uh, so we keep on marching there uh, pretty uh, pretty actively. Then we want to um, demonstrate some, like with our uh, partners, some use cases. So carry cargo um, using uh, our. So we have a Part One Thirty Five certificate, meaning that we X Wing is an airline and has the we're allowed to carry uh, for revenue. Uh, cargo. So we want to work with our partners to uh, demonstrate the use case initially uh, in what is called OPS, so optionally piloted aircraft. So we're going to have a safety pilot on board, but we're going to be controlling from the ground so that we can demonstrate uh, how do you integrate into a large airport? Uh, how do you interact with air traffic control? Um, what are all the corner cases that we didn't think of You know where we, we operate? But if you go into other locations, what are all the specific on our cases that we need to account for in our final product? So our goal is really to um, to be with our uh, partners, with our customers, um, you know, at the airport, uh, in the air, so that we can really gather all those requirements and design the uh, the best product. Um, our approach is not to design a product and then sell it. We really want to get and uh, understand the needs. So we are designing the product, we are operating the aircraft and certifying it at the same time. And that, so that we can update the technology, certify it again, put it into service until we are really happy with the, uh, with the technology. And at that point, that's when we can think about licensing it. Uh, but in the short term, being able to close the loop um, on ourselves to iterate on the certification aspect is very important to uh, to move forward fast. Mm -hmm. And at this stage of the company, are you already selling to paying customers or are you waiting for full certification before you're able to do this? So we are a uh, an airline. We carry cargo for passenger for uh, uh, for our customers. Uh, so we have paying customers and progressively we're adding the technology. So we're not waiting to have the full solution before entering the market. So, um, and then you're actually an airline and you're actually delivering stuff yourself and temporarily for now piloting the these aircraft while there's also this sen sensor and data capture that's happening at, um, to train the autonomy. Exactly. So we have the pilot, we put our technology on board uh, so that we gather data for the certification. Uh, for instance, the detect and avoid is a new technology. There is nobody has certified um, such a system yet. So we need to gather enough uh, flight data to show how it performs in all conditions. So be, having our sensors and our technology on the aircraft that perform uh, daily operations then we're building up all the required uh, information uh, all the data set uh, for certification. So it's a it's a win-win situation. The FA gets a lot of, the, of data, we get a lot of flight hours, and then we can certify it faster. Awesome. Thank you very much for speaking with us today. This was really amazing. You're very welcome. Thank you very much for having me. We hope you enjoyed listening to Maxime discuss the intricacies of autonomous flight. There's plenty more to discover at robohop.org forward slash podcast, including information of how you can become a patron for Robohub. As a community supported podcast, we are run by a team of volunteers from around the world, and we rely on small donations from listeners like yourself to help us keep going. So check out how you can get involved and become a supporter, patron or volunteer at robohop.org forward slash podcast. Our next episode will air in two weeks time. Until then, goodbye.